Roger. Lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading you loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, no problem. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 25, 2020 edition of Space News. This is Peter Rowden. I've got the full team here tonight. We're joined by Tina Stagg, Michael Abdullah, and Angelo De Grazia. We're all from the Space Association of Australia. So let's get started with some more Australian space news. Queensland-based Valiant Space has successfully test-fired the first commercially developed liquid-fueled rocket engine in Australian history. The company's momentum engine ignited for the first time after more than a year of system integration and inert propellant testing. Valiant Space Chief Executive Andrew Yusensky said the tests couldn't have come at a better time. We're really excited about our next phase of development. The company, based in Brisbane, is developing rocket propulsion technologies to help propel the next generation of spacecraft to, to and from the moon. Valiant Space will integrate the engine into an Earth-based rocket that will simulate lunar descent, landing and traversing manoeuvres. Valiant Space Chief Operating Officer Brian Greenham said, This is a key component in our plans to deliver commercial and scientific payloads to unique locations on the Moon and bring them back. The live firing was performed at Beyond the Blues Aerospace's launch and test facility Funny Farm Space, north of Gundawindi, Queensland. Beyond the Blue Aerospace representative and CEO of Black Sky Aerospace, Blake Nikolic, said, The times remain challenging for farmers in remote areas, and our facility is creating diversification, driving economic benefit for the region. Black Sky Aerospace, known for its own rocket launch vehicles and space technology, provided logistical support local expertise and independent evaluation to ensure the test was compliant with regulatory and safety factors. The test was an important step towards Australia being able to put scientific and commercial payloads on the moon, allowing active participation in international collaborative programs such as NASA's Moon to Mars program. All right, and it's across to Michael. Thank you, Peter. Let's turn to New Zealand. Rocket Lab is continuing with plans for its next launch at the end of this month. A company spokesperson said last week that the next Electron launch remained on track with a launch no earlier than March 30. The company's launch team is in place, as are all the payloads for the mission. The New Zealand government closed its borders in response to the coronavirus pandemic last week allowing only citizens and residents into the country. Rocket Lab says it has achieved an initial NASA certification of its Electron launch vehicle. The company said last week the NASA Launch Services Program gave the vehicle a Category 1 certification, making it eligible to launch payloads for companies or organisations willing to accept a higher level of risk. The certification was largely based on data from a December 2018 launch of a set of CubeSats for NASA's Venture Class Launch Services Program. Rocket Lab says NASA is now evaluating the rocket for a Category 2 certification, enabling it to launch higher-value NASA payloads. And meanwhile, Rocket Lab is acquiring a SmallSat component company, Rocket Lab, and Rocket Lab announced last week it is buying Toronto-based Sinclair Interplanetary for an undisclosed sum. Sinclair makes components such as reaction wheels and star trackers for small sats. Rocket Lab said it would use Sinclair components on its Photon small sat bus and provide resources to Sinclair to scale up its business. And over to Tina. Thanks, Mike, and good evening, space fans. In NASA news and the Commercial Crew Program, NASA says it's targeting a launch of a Crew Dragon spacecraft with two NASA astronauts on board for the latter half of May. The agency said last week it was scheduling the SpaceX Demo 2 mission launch from the Kennedy Space Centre to the International Space Station for no earlier than mid to late May and was starting the media accreditation process for the mission. 
NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley will fly on Demo 2, the first crewed orbital launch from US soil since the end of the shuttle program in 2011. The announcement didn't disclose the length of the mission as NASA considers whether to extend the mission to address a shortfall in the station's crew. NASA acknowledged the coronavirus could affect both planning for the mission and media access for the launch. And continuing with coronavirus and NASA's lunar program, and NASA is suspending work on the Space Launch System and Orion at two NASA centres because of the coronavirus pandemic. NASA announced last week that it was elevating the Michoud Assembly Facility and Stena Space Centre to Stage 4 of its pandemic response framework. The decision effectively shuts down both facilities, allowing only those personnel needed for safety and security to be on site. That puts a halt to work such as SLS core stage testing at Stennis and manufacturing of the SLS core stages and Orion components at Michoud. Meanwhile, NASA's human spaceflight head says the Lunar Gateway is no longer in the agency's critical path for a 2024 lunar return. Doug Lavero, Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, said cost and schedule concerns led him to decide not to rely on the Gateway for a 2024 landing. But he said the agency was still committed to developing the outpost in lunar orbit in cooperation with international partners for use on later missions. Lavero also suggested NASA was moving away from a lander approach that required aggregating components at the Gateway or elsewhere in lunar orbit. He said the revised plan for the Artemis program was not yet locked into stone, but should be completed and released in the near future. A report by NASA's Office of Inspector General found cost and schedule issues with the development of the Space Launch System's launch platform. The report said the Mobile Launcher, or ML1, platform suffered more than $300 million in overruns and years of delays. ML1 was originally built for Constellation's Ares-1 rocket, but needed significant work to modify it for use by SLS. The report blamed both immature SLS and Orion requirements that caused significant rework of the platform, as well as poor performance by one contractor. NASA addressed some of those issues with plans for a second mobile launcher, ML2, for the Block 1B version of the SLS, but the report warned the changes might not prevent cost and schedule problems. ML1 will ultimately cost $927 million, but will be used for no more than four SLS missions. spacecraft that will fly on the Artemis 1 mission has completed environmental testing. NASA held a ceremony at Plum Brook Station in Ohio to mark the end of the tests, which included thermal vacuum and electromagnetic environment testing. Lockheed Martin, the Orion Prime contractor, said the tests were extremely successful with no major issues found. The spacecraft will be flown back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida later this month for final launch preparations. And back to Mike. Thank you, Tina. Let's look at NASA planetary and space science programs. Operations of some ongoing Mars missions are threatened by an overstressed Mars budget. The agency's fiscal year 2021 budget proposes to end operations of the 2001 Mars Odyssey Orbiter and reduce operations of the Curiosity rover. NASA officials said available funding for extended mission longevity is limited, even as NASA seeks money to start work on future Mars sample return missions, as well as Mars Ice Mapper an orbiter that would search for subsurface water ice and serve as a communications relay. Cost overruns last year on the Mars 2020 mission also contributed to austerity measures for other Mars programs. Mars 2020 remains on schedule for a launch in July. 
Meanwhile, NASA has fixed a problem with its Mars lander by telling it to hit itself with a shovel. The InSight lander's digging probe has been stuck below the Martian surface for more than a year. After a few failed attempts to get it out, NASA had to get a bit creative. Ultimately, it freed the probe by giving it a solid thwack with InSight's shovel. With tentative results that the mole is now working, NASA hopes to again task it with burrowing beneath the surface of Mars. And over to Angelo. Thanks, Mike. And let's go to Russia. Russia is struggling to attract applicants to its cosmonaut corps. Who would have thought of that, eh? Roscosmos said about 900 people had applied to become a cosmonaut after the agency opened a year-long recruitment campaign last June. By contrast, NASA received more than 18,000 applications in its previous astronaut selection round in 2015. NASA has not disclosed how many applications it has received so far from an ongoing application process that is open until the end of this month. Across to China, the first launch of a new variant of a Chinese rocket failed last week. A Long March 7A rocket lifted off from the coastal Wenchang Satellite Launch Center, but state-run media reported about two hours later that the launch had failed. The report gave no additional information about the cause of the failure. The Long March 7A is a version of the Long March 7, which had made two previous successful launches with an upper stage adapted from the one used on the Long March 3B. Depending on what caused the failure, other Chinese rockets could be grounded including the Long March 5. Over to Japan. The asteroid Rai Ugu reminds scientists of instant coffee. Japanese scientists working on the Hayabusa 2 mission to Rai Ugu say the asteroid is highly porous. About half of the asteroid's volume is voids, something consistent with the rubble pile model of its formation from debris aggregated from the breakup of a larger body. The surface texture of Ryugu, said one scientist, is something like freeze-dried coffee. Okay, back to the United States and SpaceX. One of the nine engines on a SpaceX Falcon 9 first stage malfunctioned during last week's Starlink launch. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk tweeted that one of the Merlin engines shut down prematurely during the flight but did not affect the rocket's ability to put the payload into its planned orbit. It wasn't clear if this problem was also the cause of the failed landing of the first stage on a drone ship in the Atlantic. Musk said that a thorough investigation would be needed before further Falcon 9 launches. Still with SpaceX, SpaceX says it has seen some success in efforts to reduce the brightness of its Starlink satellites, although astronomers believe it still remains a problem. The company said last week an experimental DarkSat launched in January with coatings designed to reduce its reflectivity had resulted in a notable reduction in its brightness. One group of astronomers comparing DarkSat to a regular Starlink satellite found the DarkSat's brightness was about half as bright as a regular Starlink satellite. But astronomers previously said they needed to reduce the satellite's brightness by a factor of 10 to 20 to mitigate the worst effects they would have on major observations. And now it's back to Pete. Thanks, Angelo. And uh, to finish off, unfortunately, with a bit more sad news, not that we haven't got enough sad news already in the world, the widow of Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, passed away. Roscosmos said last week Valentina Gagarina had died at the age of 84, but it did not disclose additional details about her death. She married Gagarin in 1957, and after his death in a plane crash in 1968, continued to work at the Cosmonaut Training Centre in Star City, publishing a memoir but otherwise staying out of public view. And that's it for the Space News this week. Thank you all for listening. We'll be with you again next week. Thank you, team. Good night.